Welcome to episode 23 of the Cathode Ray podcast. I'm here with my friend Steve Nutter. We're going to be wrapping up the work that Steve's been doing in the last week. Um, we had the big expose, expose, explanation on S video last week. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of a recap of that. And we're going to be talking about this work that Steve's doing with museums and kind of dig it into that. So Steve, how you doing, mate? You've been working hard. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, I, I've... Uh... I've not worked like this hard since like senior year of college when you actually <laughs> have to put forth a stupid, what is it like a, I can't even remember what they called a it. thesis you know, or something? Yes, you have to have your thesis around your your specific uh, graduating whatever degree yeah, you're in. You have to come up with a thesis and it's something that you have to do, divulge all this time in. So that's been, it's been an experience. I'm glad I got a good start on it and was able to clear things up the way it has. Um, it has, it has put like the repair stuff on pause for the most part for two weeks, but, uh, I, I think this investment now is going to be better off for next time where I won't have to, you know, just come up with a complete day's worth of presentations to enter entertain people. <laughs> for sure. I think you are over preparing. I think there's too yeah, much probably. content there and that's fine. That's probably even better because you need to run these courses for the first time, then learn the pacing, learn, okay, do I, how many of these examples do I need to show or something? And then, and it's better to have, you know, throw away some material than to be caught short. So you're doing, you're doing well with it. Yeah, that's that's what when I was talking to the guy who's uh, my contact at the museum, that's kind of I was like, look, I'm going to probably have too much stuff, but I'd rather have too much stuff. And then I can decide which one of it to kind of axe through the program um, and kind of move to because I will be there working for three days total. Mm -hmm. uh, but the there's only one day like dedicated to present presentations in front of like specific people who are traveling in. Uh, for this one full day so that's the one day i've been specifically preparing for uh it's also this is a really cool thing we're going to try out some new stuff on this episode with some screen sharing mm. and i will give you some sneak peeks on some of these uh presentations that i've been working on um so that's that should be fun Sure. So we're gonna we're, we're gonna start with the S video stuff. Then we'll get into Steve stuff. Add num. Yeah. If you are watching uh, on audio, we appreciate that. Uh, when we get into that, when we get into the history stuff later in the episode, there will be a lot of visual components to that. So you may want to switch over to watching that on YouTube later on. Um, I saw some of that. So yeah, for me this week, it's just some updates to how things are moving forward with the S video cause. Um, I, I put out, uh, my video on the topic, then we did our podcast. Then also Lou from Lou's retro source did a great video. Lou and I are friends. We, we talk and we collaborate on these things. Uh, I'm just glad I got my, my video out first. Cause he's got way more followers <laughs> than me. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, laughing. I was like, you told me Lou was coming that I saw his video. Yeah. Lou's great. But the first, I mean, literally the first time I heard about Lou was when you interviewed him. And uh, that was, and that was, shoot, I mean, that was probably, what, about six months ago almost? Yeah, maybe, maybe five a bit months. more, yeah. A and, bit more than uh, that, maybe, yeah. Yeah, he's really, you know, blossomed into this good mm. source of quick information every time something happens on the mister. And a lot of things that uh that he comes out with yeah and i was like glad yeah you know, i was like oh well lewis you've been working on this s video stuff for, for a while so i was glad to see you have that and then also getting uh getting to feature your work on retro rgb is always mm -hmm. fun and and awesome um so that that's a really great plus and uh yeah so i thought i thought that was all cool yeah so it's all coming along so the updates this week that we have is that um Mike Simone has uh, f finished the design for his adapter. He's got a PCB design done. He he showed it to me uh, just today. Uh, so that's something, that's an open source thing. That's something he's going to be producing some of. Um, Mike was very kind. He was like, Lewis, uh, can I send you one? And I said, do you want to ship it to Estonia, mate, or not? Uh, it's a bit of a problem. So we might arrange to get sent to you, Steve, instead. Uh, so Mike's got his adapter that's coming out and also the other one, other Mr. Creator from uh, Spain, Antonio Vilena, who's very much uh, always uh, talked about in this. He's come out seemingly really quickly with his own version. 
and Antonio has the uh, the original RGBS to S video composite adapter that's been out for a long time. I made the videos on that. That's more than a year old, at least that video uh, reviewing that. Now that adapter will have the dot core problems that any external adapter will have. Any external adapter will have the problems. It's not something specifically about Antonio's solution. But what he's done is he's made an adapter that looks the same, like in the same form factor and the same kind of dongle size, um, but it's meant for Mike's cores instead. So he's calling it the Cheapy. Um, it's uh, it's called the Cheapy, and it's only 15 It's called euros. the Cheapy. The cheap, no, Cheapo, Cheapo, Cheapo. That's right. It's the Cheapo adapter, like and it's only 15 euros, because I think the because that's the thing, the regular, his old school one, was like 50 or 45 or a more significant yeah. amount. So that's a, that's real quickly, that is a cool little interesting development, how quickly Mr. Mm. Stuff is developing. And in a good example of how something that was made that was very necessary and needed has already gone through its life cycle. And now it can be redesigned to something that's completely cheap, which in this day and age is a much better thing to have just m minimal components, cheap uh, accessible as compar compared to something more expensive as logic on it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, I mean, and then I'm glad Antonio is able to flip that around and come out with the cheapo. <laughs> yeah. So he's got that one out there. So he, uh, and uh, so pluses and minuses of living in Europe minus that Mike can't send me his, but Antonio can send me his one. So Antonio's put one of those in the post for me. So I'm going to get a little review of that up hopefully next week. Um, I expect that Antonio's adapter and Mike's adapter, I expect them to both work the same. I don't expect there to be like differences or one's better or another. It's a, it's an open source design. It's not like someone's competing or something like that. Uh, and it may come down to literally what I just mentioned. Where are you? Is there a creator, a producer of this design close to you that's, that's easy to get? That's why I was... I bought a bunch of stuff from Antonio because the shipping's not that bad to to get it to me from Spain. So that's moving along really fast uh, a lot and uh, generating a lot of interest. And the final thing is I was um, got some updates from Mike because the uh, it seems to me, I think Mike underestimated how popular Composite was going to be. I think he didn't get it at first, how like everyone's looking for that. And that then means that the the first question that always comes is, why do we have to do this S video, blah, 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 run around, two signals, mixing it together, yeah. Luma trap. Why can't composite just come from a pin on the IO board? And I asked Mike about that on Twitter. And he says that um, he feels that it's uh, a significant more amount of work, uh, significant and Possibly, uh, it, w it would, um, it was a, a lot of work. It would actually uh, take up a lot of resources, in his words, and it may not even be possible. So it's, it's one of those things in video, I think, that you just think like, oh yeah, well, if you're outputting S video, then output composite, what's the problem? But it's one of those things that's actually much more nuanced and there's a lot more under the surface. And Mike's solution was, well, S video is so much easier to do and all you need is a very few simple passive components in the cable so he was like well here's the thing i could wait six more months or 12 more months and get this out later or i could bang out s video right now simple adapter boom and it's done um which is why we've come to that not to say it's impossible but that's how he came yeah. to that design choice well you're trying to come up with a digital uh platform using a digital platform to come up with a core solution kind of for the analog video when mm. there's already a solution out there that's just like a lot of the analog signals were just really t attuned with basic components um mm. tons of them usually but yeah this is like this has already been solved i understand what he's saying because there must be something in there where it's like hard to get a digital device to like mm. properly recreate the simple fact of what this thing is doing on its own. Right. Like the, Hard the to erraticness, do digital, probably the erraticness of composite, right? Mm. It's like, so, um, yeah, I think that, like you say, the best thing right now is I always, I always wanted one of these adapters before from based on your video, but the problem, again, is 
it's it's expensive, hard to ship to me in the United States. It was always sold out because of parts. You know, mm. it's open source. So this is a solution that we all should be happy about. It's getting around to all this. And then, like you say, if you just want to buy one from somebody, thankfully that we're going to have maybe a couple of possibilities to have some of these stocked in places. And uh, so we'll just see how that goes. But Yeah. So, look, and that's just the news from the last week. So right, this thing that's is quick. so fast, yeah. Because we were just been... talking last week about this stuff just being developed, and now it's already into this. So, mm. so who knows what the the next weeks are coming on? Who's going to pick it up? So, thanks again, Antonio. Thanks to him. Thanks to Mike for continuing to work on this. I know he's working real hard on, on defining it, and uh, actually, and not just working on software. He's actually making a bunch. I don't know about his plans to sell them, but they're definitely open source. So um, yeah. he's definitely made a bunch of prototypes uh, for that. So cool. Well, so yeah, I think yeah, on. and I think that there's always um, a lot of people want composite, and just I don't think it's that big of a deal. Again, to to go and just do this little conversion thing compared to I know it would be wonderful to just pump it right out. Hmm. of the mister but you know it's 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 a lot harder obviously <laughs> than it seems yeah some things it just there's something weird that some things are way harder in digital and much much easier in analog and mike's made the clever engineering choice to do what is best in analog to get that best and, and keep in, in digital there and and as you say look if you, it looks like i mean it looks like you you'll get the adapter and then a pigtail for 20 bucks maybe i'm gonna guess in the end like to get all of that for a small little thing it's gonna be about this long a little dongly lead hanging off it for 20 bucks uh, i reckon it's a fairly good solution you know what i mean like yeah uh, absolutely to be able to and then think about it, you're just not well this isn't like you have to go buy like right now if i want to run from my even just my simple uh, modded console if i want to go composite video straight out of it mm. i have to have a composite cable and then i have to have a separate s video cable that's good and th so now you know and then they're all just one end a nintendo proprietary end this time you're getting you know you can use any quality then high mm. quality cables from the mister out and you're just you know you just got this little dongle and with the little leads hanging off it i feel like that's the best thing to do is to have some leads probably coming off it where it's got a cable design so that it's not so hard on mm. the mister gives it some um that io port you know uh i feel like it would be good to have a little bit of drag in there but yeah that's just a physical part of it but that's you know that's that's a good solution to me because like Ooh. before i'd have four or five cables each console <laughs> right <laughs> right so and then and each one of those cables like mm -hmm. if you go buy, I love the Insurrection Industries cable for the Nintendo. That's S Video. It's great, but at the same time, it costs just as much as this solution. Sure. So twenty bucks for a very multi-purpose cable, and oh yeah, the other the other thing I discovered on this sort of mystery S Video composite topic this week is I was enlightened to the AliExpress seller Retro Castle. Now, I uh, had a bias. I thought anyone on AliExpress was bit funks. I didn't understand that there are some sellers on there who are legitimately, you know, tried to make uh, good designs and working on it. And it turns out that Retro Castle, uh, it's a, as much as I've understood, it's a Chinese guy, you know, and he's made these uh, Mr. He's made his own Mr. IO board. And instead of the VGA port, he's put a Saturn DIN, like a Saturn out that was used on the Sega Saturn. And then on the IO board, he's doing the conversion from RGB to S-Video and composite. And what impressed me and surprised me, and I'm happy to be surprised and impressed me, is that this guy, I, I was actually been chatting with him on Discord. He's in the Mr. FPGA Discord. And he explained to me, like, he gets it. Like, he understands the issue of dot crawl and he's done his best to uh, overcome that he understands that his solution will introduce dot crawl on the s video and composite lines and he's actually introduced uh variable pots like little knobs that you twist like that and you 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 can twist them per core to tune it in and as i've been told from other sources um 
if you do that on a per core basis, you get well, really, really good S video and composite. So I'm uh, happy to learn that there are actually some really great sellers on AliExpress. Uh, Cause I was like, someone said, Hey, there's an IO ball with a satin plug. And I'm like, yeah. what the fuck are I'll, you talking yeah. about? <laughs> I, I was, well, I saw your post on that. Do you remember what like the, what was the price for you for that IO board? Uh, it was about 80 euros, I think, delivered, okay, so something like, like that. Okay, so bucks here, so, if I, yeah. and it plus shipping. But um, I usually can get it shipped here. I just It just takes a while from them. But Yeah, I'm used I mean, to that's that. Something, so. <laughs> I feel like that's something that's, um, you and I were having a conversation about this. That's exciting to me to have uh, all these options with the Mister is just awesome and how fast all this stuff, you find it, and then it mm. just keeps getting better. But also... Um, these cool little things that will have their place because again, like you say, you can variably change that. And who's to say that like you wouldn't have certain, if you like me, you have a bunch of CRTs. What if one CRT, um, you hooked it up and it looked a little bit better with just a slight touch of dot, <laughs> you know, yeah. or okay. like you liked that mm -hmm. or just for me, it's really fun to have something where you could show an awesome example of like, here's dot crawl. Here's here's what it looks like when it's been corrected to the mm. correct levels. You could have something on the mister that just easily demonstrates that for any, you know, for something to show. Like, uh, I thought I thought that's awesome. Like, so I, I finding out that it's actually legitimate because like you most of the time. When I see AliExpress, it's just like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> sure, yeah. Right. So I don't, a lot of times you're worried about supporting somebody that's, that's like, oh, I don't want to go, you know, buy something even accidentally that a friend of mine or even somebody that's working really hard, I don't know, mm -hmm. has a version here that's been stolen for God's sakes, you know? So I, I always like, you know, so, but it's good to hear that, you know, we've got a little bit of vetting on this. And that some other people have tried this board and had um, a good experience with it. Yeah, it's like, it seems to be another example, like with Mike. Like, again, we just talked through about Mike's decision to to have S-Video and not Compass and what are the pluses and minuses. Again, in, with this uh, with the, with this um, retro castle guy who's put the variable pots on there, it's just in both cases, it's an engineer sitting down and saying, I understand the problem. I see there's a problem. I'm going to try and take just the most logical, what's the easiest, but still producing the best results balance solution. And I like that. The, they explain why they did it. And I'm like, yeah, that, you know, you, you're a smart person. You have made a pretty reasonable, maybe that's not for everyone. Doesn't matter. But you've made a pretty reasonable assumption in your engineering to, to get this product out the door. And that I can respect. So it's cool. Well, yeah, and absolutely, a, and a portion of that comes out to too, where people are so open uh, with the Mister Project in a uh, open source community style that everybody can go in now and easily access the work that these engineers and people have done with their passion, and then they go in and take that work and use that to affect their research, either to say, I'm not going down that path because he already did and improved, it didn't work, or saying, oh, I love that design and I can take that design and make it better, Where it, it's, which is probably something that happened with Mike. And then you think, originally you have the adapter from Antonio that needed to have the logic on there, yet he knew, like you said, both of them knew there was the dot crawl problem and it's like one had to come before the other and then it but the open source nature of it made it happen so quickly where you can research access someone's research mm -hmm. and talk to them like through discord or whatever channels now uh so there's there's still that good aspect of this community that i always see kind of happening uh, even though there are some other things that you know go on people are always dramatic there's <laughs> there's there's still um, this good example of how the open source uh, works, I think. Right, I think so too. Have you discharged your CRTs today, Steve? <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't. Like, I haven't. I was laughing. Um, I put this presentations, these presentations all together, and I was getting to the. I was like, well, I have to put a slide about discharging a CRT in here somewhere, and I was, I was like, 
I've I know for a fact how I'm like I've got this whole big presentation planned for the specific Sony PVM twenty thirty, mm-hmm. and it's got. Uh, I have so many broken ones that I tore one apart and I cleaned every single circuit board, you know, so I took high res pictures of it and then I'm going to have the presentation where I'm holding up the physical board going, look here, this goes bad a lot. Check this. If you're looking at this, you know, what does this board do? How does this work in conjunction with this whole system and breaking it down like that? But um it's like after making all that, I got to the point of discharging a CRT and the 2030 has that terrible variable resistor, which we've talked about before, that contraption with the big plastic built-in thing on yeah. the anode cap. And I've shown you like mm-hmm. a new part um, back in one of our one. first yeah. ones. Hmm. So there's that in there. And I'm like, I'm not discharging that monitor like within their thing. I'm like, I'm just going to see what it's like to discharge one of these Dotronics monitors. So I have to like do a course on Dotronics monitor that I've never seen in person and never worked on. I've just seen the pictures of them. They're real simple. Uh, but I'm like, well, heck, we're just gonna we're just gonna dive in and see that. I just have a like thing saying safety alert, CRT <laughs> discharge incoming. And so uh we'll see how that one goes. That's gonna be one of those things. It's just gonna however it happens on the fly happens. So okay, you gotta do it. I gotta have my your DRTs, yeah. But yeah, I'm hoping that the dot, the Dotronics is like the least. I couldn't even find basically ten slides worth of stuff. Hmm. So it's all good. I'm like, all right, this is the portion where we're just going to tear this monitor all the way apart and put it all back together if we need some time to fill. So there's not much <laughs> info out there on the dot, Dotronics ones, is what you're saying? I, I mean, no, because the company still makes them. Um, not very many, but it is the guy that Bob did an interview oh, with. Yeah, we talked about a that. couple yeah, years yeah, yeah, yeah. ago. Uh, he still has some, but not many, and. So there's not as much information out there on them. I mean, you see them in art installations a lot, and uh, they just don't have the following that the gamer. There's not as many gamers on it because the if you go and like try to buy one from the company, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's going to be at least as much as a PVM, and so you're stuck where they're only in the art world. And the only way people get them is if they're like a silly art museum decides to get rid of their stuff instead of keep it which isn't really the case now mm-hmm. so there's not as many of them because i put out posts asking people all over the internet for dotronic stuff and i i mean it was the only time i ever got crickets back it was like no, nothing it was like one person sent a gif what do you i guess type in dotronics it gives you a gif and i was like well oh, great so not a lot out there i did manage to find some cool pictures but not many it took a while oh. um so let's um yeah let's yeah. go through the work that you've been doing for the last week. Let's sure. start from the start on it, and um, yep. you've been making these presentations, preparing this info, and we're going to share some of this info with the uh, the people here. Yeah, so um, I'm getting ready for basically at this time, a week from now, I'll be doing this. I'll be giving this presentation. So <laughs> it's kind of crazy to think about, but uh, I've got a pretty lengthy presentation that's an updated uh i do have a crt presentation like master class from a couple of gaming shows that i used to give and so this is an updated version of that that goes way more in detail uh, on the history of the crt and how it was uh, ultimately developed what it started from the technology that it was birthed out of which was just glass vacuum tubes and so that's, I mean, I go back to all the way to the scientists who worked on this in the 1800s. These are like, the, I guess, the rock stars of the 19th century, right? These um, Nobel Prize laureate scientists. So there's, of course, this is like we're talking about open source here with the mister. This science back in these days was very open source where you would go publish your work. And you were happy that other scientists grabbed your work and based their studies off of it. And that is the snowball effect of the science of that time that these guys were ultimately able to use these devices like vacuum tubes to prove that electrons existed. And at the same time, make a display out of it, you know, by using by their experiments. It led to a display technology that became the display technology for the next uh, century. The, the CRT is one of the most important um, technological pieces of the 20th century, if you think about it. It was the medium 
that uh, you know before that you probably had the printing press okay. and the newspaper, so. and the 20th century would have been the television. All right, and in our, our the century will be was internet. Te- right. The revolution so. was televised. That's how we quote unquote watch the revolution. We we watched it on our TV sets. We watched everything. Not not only was it the first medium. Okay, this or the next medium. Sorry, of information dissemination where it came straight into our eyeballs. Didn't even need twenty four hours of printing presses at home. Um, but just the applications. I mean, anything in society. And the I need a readout. I'm piloting a plane and i need a screen oh here's a screen you know i need screens for things not just for cnn in my eyeballs both of those things could you imagine uh like what it must have been like to travel before there was a real screen display and you would go into like um more than likely a train station but also I would imagine it have to be done by like chalk, even like the earliest. No, those flippy ones. Right, the, the flippy things. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like that's what you'd be looking at, and so that's like that's how much it's changed. So mm. everything was able to change so quickly and cost effectively eventually with the CRT. So that's a big presentation. It's like almost a hundred slides right now, filled with stuff, and it also gets into. Um, the difference between shadow mask and uh, aperture grill. And then I have some demonstrations talking about specifically what is happening inside a CRT. And, and I try to explain this in a factual way of like build up. So each one of these is building on each other. So this is the first one. And then we get into the end of it on like all different types of modern CRTs, how a modern CRT works. And from those diagrams and graphs, then we're going to jump into the two classes after that, specifically on the Sony PVM 2030 and then the Dotronics monitor. And uh, the, the PVM 2030 class is going to be unreal. Um, I'm sure what I, I, I mean, and I, what I eventually will probably section these presentations out and, and make them into YouTube videos because I feel like eventually – there will be some good information there, you know, and mm-hmm. um, I, I know there's good information there, but I think eventually it will be something that people will like to see it just somewhat. I don't want to have them all in the one presentation format, though, like this, because I'd like to offer that to like, you know, businesses sure. as a as a consultation. And so then we're moving into the fourth presentation I have, which is actual examples of CRTs in art. Mm -hmm. And uh, how that has changed throughout the 20th century. A lot of the pieces and show pieces that are in art that you may get to go see in an exhibit someday. And I've really been just studying a few artists and their impact on all kinds of things. So um, that's been a lot of fun. That one was the one I just finished up yesterday. I have one final presentation I'm working on covering uh, video formats and video resolutions. Oh yeah, really. And important. devices um, for like downscaling because I'm sure that's an issue for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the last one I'm preparing. I'm I'm a little bit like because it, it, you always get to these point with these presentations, you know, where you get something done, and you're like, I got to work on a brand new one now. And it's kind of like then you're in the research mode, and it's like you realize once you start getting them going, sometimes they just take off, right? You find the right <laughs> information. And they take off on their own, but I don't know. So that's that's the next one. Okay, so you got those. And that uh, to, to recap for the listeners, that, that last one was one that really interested me in our discussion that we had on, on your channel, which was when uh, the discussion about how do you store and then display the media that is being displayed on the CRT. Yes, it's one thing to repair a PVM. It's one thing to choose the monitor and the aperture grill and all of this. But what about the content that's actually being displayed? A lot of times it's some loop or presentation, some sort of visual art that the artist has created. And it was either a VHS or a DVD. How do you preserve that? And then if you're going to digitize that material, which might seem like the first logical step, oh, we'll digitize it. Of course, we'll store it. That's the best way. Fine. But then how do you get that back out into... 240p 480i and make it look on the crt how it looked originally i think all of us in retro gaming who have ever fooled around with any sort of hdmi to see to 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 downscaling know that it's really easy to not get the desired result when getting it out of a computer taking a file 
using one of those, uh, even if lag isn't a problem, okay, maybe lag's not a problem here, but those, the way that those uh, AliExpress HDMI to composite converters, I'm not, they, they play with the aspect ratio, they do other things. It's not as simple as going, well, I don't care about lag, so I can use a cheap device. So it's a hugely complicated topic, and uh, I'd be really interested to actually watch your presentation myself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot. So there's, um, yeah, that's that's an important one that I'm like thinking about too, still a lot. And there's a lot of uh, things because, like you say, what? If, well, if you're trying to digitize analog video, how do you know you have the right digitizer? You could have the most expensive one, and odds are we're running it like. So this is a great example. Like Bob, for thank God, thank goodness, he found something else. I was worried about him and his sanity for a while when he was going going after the speaker people. It's a worry and that never leaves me. <laughs> the speaker people and how they were claiming all these speakers that are new are shielded, right? And then he would constantly run in where they would interfere with a CRT tube. And you come to the realization that they can say they're shielded because it's just like they've changed the definition of shielding in the last 20 years to oh, not okay. include the specs that were important to the CRT tube because it's a past technology. So it's it's like they don't uh, they don't get it because they're designing based on a spec that's like no that according to this spec this is shielded. Mm. But so that's the frustrating thing. Think of that on the other end where you're like trying to find the best device for capturing old footage and digitizing that and then not intending to play that back on a digital platform, right? Mm. Because a lot of them probably digitize it to make it look like something good for 480p and above and HDMI quality and, you know, uh -huh. that level. So you've especially in these older pieces, you've got to be concerned with that because a lot of these pieces I've realized from studying them, they were just based on the condition of these CRTs or the video format. So they were intending on having this low resolution image bloom mm. through and not be so easy to focus on. It's like, you know, a Christopher Nolan shot film versus some other rookie where you can tell just like the shots intrigue you mm. just from watching it, you know, compared to something that's just straight up shot in a completely different manner. Um, I feel like you lose some of that if you can go, you know, and, and easily, Right, stumble on something. So I think that's a right. important Actually, okay, presentation. Actually, okay, let's stop on that moment there because to me, um, the okay, so there's the digitizing, which is the I've got to digitize something in the first place, and then I've got to get it back out and could do the digital to analog. And on my first thinking of this really fast is that the digitizing might be the most straightforward because we stick a retro tink in the middle, composite in. HDMI 240p comes out and I can digitize that. Um, now that's one school of thought. One school of thought says, bring it in, line double it to deinterlace it to 480p. And then I guess then you're going to have to though on that in that example, come up with a clever way to then get it back out into the appropriate 240p or 480i in the manner that it was. Now I can imagine there are other methods that if you bring it in and don't deinterlace it, keep it sort of, I don't know. I don't really know where I'm going with this, but I could imagine the example where if you, if you brought it in uh, more authentically, for lack of a more technical term, it might be easier to spit out that way, but you're going to have a harder time digitizing it in that more authentic way. I could see, uh, I mean, I think every solution is going to be a balance. It's going to be, it's yeah, and I, I'm interested to see what they're doing if yes. they'll, they'll if they'll reveal any of that. But also, we're um, when we're talking about game stuff, we're concerned with 240p. 240p, I doubt is going to be anywhere really on their radar. I doubt mm. it really matters as much. So that's one at least half the obstacles gone. Okay. Yep. But at the same time, you've got to think. So um, there are devices that can take. And they're usually older devices, Extrons and things, that somehow you can come out of a device with like uh, 480p to 1080p and spit it into this device, and it will give you a good 480i image out of it. It won't go down to 240p 
because those ones have all been gobbled up, like the Extron and Moshe's and stuff. So that might be like, and that's going to be where I'm going to be exploring some of these uh, ideas to them. And they have not, you know, they wouldn't have any idea about the retro tank or those kind of items. And maybe something like I was looking at the design of the 4X from the new retro tank, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? The 4X, he was showing Mike. Oh, yeah, the the 4KX. 4KX. That might be. 4K or whatever. Anyway. See, I don't know. See, I wish I was like, maybe we could convince Mike to make some, maybe if the museum world will put money towards it, we can convince maybe. him to make something that but does do the opposite. Need, like goes you need, backwards. You wouldn't it you need the, the most basic retro tink, like the OG one. Right. That yeah, just inputs thinking. composite and then outputs 480p over HDMI. And it'll take the 480i, it'll deinterlace it, uh, I guess, to 480p i guess that I think would line the doubles it yeah i'm not sure like line what. doubles it or something like that and then you if you stored it as my first thoughts on this i don't know if this is the real solution if you got it in as 480p then getting it back out through some sort of extron device may be the most straightforward that way. seems like it right and then you could just keep it in kind of 480p and then it's not going to mess with your aspect ratio, which right. is a good thing. I think that's mm. going to be probably the most important thing is just keeping the correct aspect ratio. But yeah, so that's that's part of that. Um, I, you and I we were talking, you know, I figured we could probably jump in and try this new feature. We were, were talking about screen sharing. Yeah, let's try that. And I'll be glad to go through um, a portion of the CRTs and the art because it's it's um, it's very visual, but it's also stuff you could talk through. And it's not like wordy, so I won't have to read a lot of things to anybody here. And we can kind of just discuss this. So let's try this and see how this goes. All right, there we go. So I've got a screen here pulled up. And this is, again, the CRTs in the art world. And um, I thought, you know, let's just go through some of this work. It won't go in the same order. Let's go in the order that I've got started here with Nam hmm. June Pike or Pak. He um, is a cr- uh, just an incredible artist from the 20th century, 1932. He passed away in 2006. He was Korean born and uh, wound up studying the arts and moved to Britain and then ultimately New York where he got into early video artwork. So we're just going to look at some of his pieces. Um, and this first one, you can look this up if you're just listening, but... Uh, it's called the Electronic Super Highway, and it's one of his biggest, most impressive pieces. If you're watching, you can see it on the screen. It's the entire continent of the United States uh, made out of CRTs, and it even, I'll show you a pic- picture, it even includes Alaska and Hawaii on a separate wall. <laughs> so let's just go down. I'll show you. That's actually the next picture right there. And uh, so, yeah, you see over there oh, on yeah. the left side yeah. how it's got them. And... So I've been studying this because it's the most amazing thing. The states are outlined with neon lights. So you have the neon light technology in there with those tubes. Mm. And then it took over 330 CRTs to build this installation. It's all on scaffolding because it goes all the way up. Again, you've got 50 states represented here for the United States. Uh, in each state, again, here's a close look at Alaska and Hawaii, but each one has an individual, like it's filled, the neon outlines the state's border, and in the inside the neon is filled with CRT tubes, and it's like a variation. There's a lot of uh, pro monitors. Here we have a section that's all JVCs in like Louisiana, and in California, they even have the JVC um, bigger just you know, consumer tube right there. And mm-hmm. then right next mm-hmm. to it is like a 14 L or N series PVM. Oh, yeah, yeah. And even and if then, you zoom in just above there, you could see yeah. like it's on blocks. Like, yeah, got, it's like the scaffolding ones. is custom yeah. built from lumber. And, um, so this artist, this was like the, one of the last big creations I feel like of his, uh, career in life. And, uh, so this is, another state here and it had all JVC TVs and it was really odd. Like, so this is all, um, back 
in the late 90s filmed. So it has these presidents. This is George Bush Sr., but it was this 90s style video edit where the presidents would just morph into each president that was next after them up to like Bill Clinton when this guy was still around. So that was that was really cool. Um, just continuing on. So this right here we were talking is an important part. So this is the state of Kansas. And I thought this was funny because just check out just check out this. What's going on here with this JVC where it's just like encased in wood, like you said, but it's got this yeah. like trap door in front of it. Oh, yeah. like, like what's going on? I think what happened here and, and this all this was explained more the more I studied this piece. So the, the, each state would have a video closed video circuit for that state and it would play a loop of um what the artist had conceptualized for that state <laughs> and like what it what the first thing that came to his head when you like here i feel like well, what do you think of when you see this state name and then like first thing that popped to your head so for kansas it was <laughs> the wizard of oz so that's what you have on the screen there is dorothy uh, in black and white on the wizard of oz oh. and so um this piece also has the uh, erratic sounds of every single one of these states playing video and having some sort of audio with that on playback at the same time so if you walk into the room it's just this loud madness right and then you hear certain things go a little bit louder over top so it's like it's like listening to it's like walking into a subway hearing so much noise and then you spot something memorable like the mcdonald's i don't know but whatever mm -hmm. you know jingle it's meant to be like that and one of the things would have been the Wizard of Oz when it's like somewhere over the rainbow comes on and it comes really loud. And I'm betting you the majority of that sound came from that JVC. <laughs> and I bet people would go up because they could reach Kansas from the floor and start like turning it down. <laughs> like it's not supposed to be that loud, right? So he probably had to build this trap door <laughs> to keep people out. It's like got wires hanging off it and uh, nailed over that so I, I i don't know i just like little things like yeah. that on this and studying this piece has been awesome um, i like how it's on the side there like he just packs them in like those little right ones. even these little five inches how they yeah they're all flipped different shapes and you got obviously one of them went dead i think right there seems to be yeah so there's a there's a one there's some more this is oh see right next to that i told you they had did oklahoma was the same way oh, yeah yep. and see yeah. look they had to do the same thing over here yeah. They have the bar right there to prevent people from turning the <laughs> Oklahoma music down. Right? I mean, what else would it be? Right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's not. It's fun to explore this kind of stuff. Um, mm. This is my state now, Virginia. And yeah, it's just kind of erratic. I don't even know what the video was, but it definitely had like CRTs every direction. Right? Left upside down, down right side that's a PBM completely upside side down there at the bottom <laughs> yeah underside and then i thought this was this was an ultimate kicker so you got right above that you got washington dc right here uh -huh. the ultimate surveillance oh, yeah. state oh yeah i was gonna say it's a camera it's yeah. a camera check it out once you get up there and like you're watching the the whole oh. thing it puts you on these little mini tvs on this closed circuit camera like you're being watched over there in DC. It was, this is that's cool, brilliant, right? So, just beautiful uh, piece of art. And this is another one of the points uh, that was very impactful of this whole piece in Mississippi. And it's the uh, I believe yeah it is or maybe maybe it's not there. I, I can't tell from this picture which state it's in. But it's the I have a dream speech from Martin Luther King, and like this was intentionally slightly louder than every other um every other piece State and piece, just so yeah. you would like vibrate and you would hear him uh and it would kind of like emanate this feeling of like uh what you know it, it's like the struggle of america is in, involved in this again something that catches your mind so it's not all like joyful blissful it's it's like it gets into some re real moments and if we're talking here for a moment uh, about the sound thing, you mm -hmm. notice a lot of these are those L and N series or the N series, specifically PVMs. And those mm -hmm. ones don't have like a button on the front that says volume. Like you have to go in and press menu and like change it to volume. So people wouldn't have known how to even change the volume on a lot of those sets. <laughs> so that's very 
interesting. The only ones that were kind of covered were the ones that probably had volume right on the front of it. Yeah, that's so interesting. Because also, like, if I'm in a museum, I'm not touching the art piece. Who the hell was going up? Oh, my gosh. You wouldn't believe this. it, man. I know, but it, it, it's surprising. At some of these okay. places, it would. They would do that. Um, uh, okay, so it looks like the Martin Luther King is Alabama. I was trying yeah. to think right mm -hmm. there. So... Yeah, that's that's just one of the pieces, though. And he donated this entire piece to the Smithsonian Museum. And they may, I don't know if it's set up. I'll find out. I'll find out if it's still available to go see there or if they have plans to ever put it back together. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, because it is all like this was the exact piece he designed. It's not something you're going to recreate two or three times because it's so crazy. Um this one was donated 330 plus CRTs, over 50 DVD players. And I did find out that they did uh, somehow digitize that and just use a, you know, a, a video playback, like video media playback instead of where you're relying on DVDs and DVD players and the cabling from that. They hmm. changed that. Uh, okay, but it did originally have like 50 or 60 DVD players, something thousands of lines of miles of cables. Such an uh, interesting case study. And and if if you're watching and, and looking at that, just think for a moment, three over 350 CRTs. Imagine the maintenance just on that art piece. That is so much maintenance for to keep one artistic piece. It's not a painting hanging on the wall that's not going to change. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, yeah. Exactly. I wonder what other art form has such a high maintenance rate. The the that's hard. Like it's, it's I mean, very interesting art form. But this, but this, you can see where an art piece like this is, um, like the apex of this career, mm -hmm. because I'll show you some of the earlier works. And again, we have to remember he's considered the father of video art, the pioneer of video art, um, because he was around when all this was becoming new. You know, through the whole era of let's go from radio to black and white television to color television and as these were new technologies for that time period this was what he was working with so here's just i mean these love i love these simplistic um art pieces which he said he started with when he was first going in the 70s and 60s this is kind of middle of the road because it's the 70s but it's called the tv buddha and you can just see what it is it's a closed circuit camera of a buddha statue looking at himself on a black and white television screen. Now it's an incredibly awesome, one of those round spherical CRTs. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's you know, space age. Like it looks right. It looks like modern, some, it's yeah. like something you would think from Stanley Kubrick film mm -hmm. style, maybe some, like almost the Jetsons. Uh, yes. The Jetsons that, that, Ooh, why can't I think of it? Space, the space movie. 2001 you know uh, yeah from kubrick it's got that like feel of that so mm -hmm. i um but there were a lot of obviously different renditions of that so i've got photos here of another one a mm -hmm. little bit different here's another one with a different style suitcase style crt that's kind of cool so i think the idea here is to have an interesting crt go along with um go along with a statue oh. but you could see how this this is a perfect fit for CRTs where there's that's an important part of this art piece is that CRT. Look, here's another one where it's like you mm. just took regular tubes, but you made it a little bit more creative by flipping them. And, you know, so you either have the really weird single CRT kind of mm. or then, you know, you can spruce it up. I feel like that's a cool thing, you know. Um, but you're not so, going to do that with like flat screens. You know, no. that's not it's like it just looks like black mirrors on the wall it's not as this not is as so fun. interesting because it's it's not just the shadow mask or the picture quality or the 240p or whatever it's actually the aesthetic of the crt case is an integral yeah. part of this art piece oh really absolutely yeah like both of those look at that i mean what mm. speaks to you i mean you're looking at that thing and you can't help but you know part a big part of that is just the actual sphere television mm. where you're like dang mm. that looks cool or even this one. I mean, it's different, but right? It's like a, a suitcase handle. Very early, I guess that was supposed to be a portable television. He might have made that. Um, hmm. But anyway, let's move on. Look at some other things. This was one of my favorites. Uh, of course, I loved all this stuff as I learned about it. And 
It's called the TV Garden, the first one in 1977. It's literally an indoor atrium garden style with like Mm -hmm. random CRTs just in it as if they're growing in a wild garden setting. And really the thing I love about these pieces is that depending on like where you go, here's another one. Depending on where you go and you set it up, you can have it look differently. And it's each one is like a different creative experience, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, um, and then here's another picture. It's just a lot of like ferns and wild, almost jungle style greenery Mm -hmm. with just random, uh, all consumer level CRTs in here with just a really, uh, it's like a single channel video, which all that means is just one video on all the TVs that would match. And uh, there it is, another one. So you're just capturing moments. Again, he has designed film to go and be played in the background, so that's unique too. And you can even see where, um, this is a good picture, and a lot of them will, will show you how the varying condition of the CRTs is prevalent like you've got purity mm. issues right here mm-hmm. and then like you could see back let's check this one back there oh yeah the <laughs> oh christ right so um it's very interesting very interesting to think about like is that intentional probably yeah. not but it's like oh it kind of adds a level of unexpected um uh, almost like the raw nature of electricity is captured within this art piece right mm. it's almost like a living kind of breathing environment especially when you add the plants that are living and breathing so i don't know um if there's any you know any time you want to interject here yeah it's know. it's tremendous you you're right actually sorry i was having a moment there when you <laughs> when you put it into those words i mean what is the the one interpretation of this art piece is the electronic nature of these electrons this art this technology juxtaposed against real life living plants the living and the artificial I don't want to know the meeting, but I, I, I see the juxtaposition the artist is doing there. Well, it's kind of interesting, oh. too, because you're considering, and, and this could not be there, but it's it's just what art does. It makes you go and think about layers when you see something. Like, are you seeing something that was meant to be there? This is like any piece, mm-hmm. right? Or are you visually just seeing it, and it's just a random action? Um, but also, like, to, to think about it as a way of, like, how nature and technology uh, especially during the 20th century, we're still, gr- I mean, it's like it does grow together almost, even though it's very different. And you could almost see how, I think that if you like redid this, maybe you could like do a futuristic version of this. We're like, <laughs> I hate to say this, but like all the trees are dying and it's just like the leaking dead technology on the ground and how like 200 years of this eventually <laughs> leads to uh, extreme environmental pain on one side, right? So Anyway, it's just like, to me, I really enjoyed that garden one. I thought that was brilliant. And every time I'd get, it's like, with this, I'm not lying, with this guy, it's like peeling back an onion. And every layer, you just, it's like more satisfying, like a morsel of caramel. (laughs) So uh, So this is another, the Viramid from 1982. Very cool. Just, again, it's a pyramid built out of nothing but, 70s and early 80s obviously Mm. style consumer sets so at the bottom you've got just a cool like corner base made like to be level see how each level is meant to be level but he did that by incorporating eight different televisions and they're like sideways and upside down and then that's the base for the pyramid and it goes up again all on a looks to be a single channel video climaxing with the uh, I don't know whether that's the capstone or the missing part before the capstone where they're uh, down with a five inch one, but that's, yeah, uh, yeah. that's just a very uh, interesting one in a corner. This one looks like something out of the <laughs> wizard of yeah. Oz again. <laughs> so I think maybe he's inspired by that. Uh, Cause that looks exactly like what I'd see, or maybe like a flash Gordon movie from like the sixties yeah, or seventies or something. Aesthetic. That was yeah, like that then, yeah. 60s, 70s idea of what mm. streamlined uh, space sci- sci-fi stuff would look like sure. incorporated around just, you know, I think it's probably 24 CRTs in there in the middle of it. Mm. Um, and that's now if you're looking at this and I've been saying single channel, this is a good example of a t- do, at least two channel, maybe three mm. channel, because you see how they have 
three different images i think on there seems and to they be, go yeah, up yeah. like almost as like a uh diagonal pattern like this way oh yeah yeah, yeah. so you got so you got a face out. there and then you got a, a bright pattern and then in, next to that it's layered how it's got three different so that's that'd be like a three channel production where you've got that going on mm. in the middle of this now this one i highly recommend anybody look up megatron matrix uh on youtube because this one will blow your mind it's like it's just um it's the most massive video wall i think i've ever seen hooked up together and the video production on it is just unreal because it it it's layered and however he's using the video matrix to have the different shots moving over top of each other it's it's just a brilliant piece of uh of art i think it's at one of the smithsonian's also that's um, amazing because okay so it's a one overall image that is them getting split up for each screen and that's not as easy as it is in the year 2020 like well now it's we've really weird because it like has screen transitions that only happen to the center where can you tell what that that big pink thing in the middle is like a cartoon saxophone player okay yeah sure I see so that, sometimes yeah. it'll play this video loop that continues on all the right side and then that middle side will change something over top of it and mm. it'll almost look three-dimensional like there's a giant uh 90s style graphic bird that like flies over top of the screen and the bird is like made of different media that looks it's just it's it's hard to explain from just a single picture sure. but i mean you know, you look at it from a picture and it looks amazing. The video of it is just even more breathtaking. It'll be interesting. Did he find a, 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 some sort of switch or something that yeah, can I don't. I mean, live? it's got to like, be is just it, like... Is the one ultimate... signal going in and live split or are they somehow... Yeah, it's got to be one of those like awesome video matrixes that you just yeah. like... And you know how to use it. And you're like, <laughs> I know how to combine these five <laughs> and make <laughs> this video wall work perfectly. That's what it is. So here's another video wall. Mm. He has a lot of crazy large video walls like this. Um, a lot more than I even found, and I keep finding more and more getting sent to me. Uh, but this is him mm. kind of towards, I'm guessing this is from the same build. It was like an article in a New Yorker magazine from the 90s. Um, here's some other things. Rose R. Uh, this was a funny one I posted on Twitter, the TV <laughs> chair. And... Uh, it was done really early on. There he is. Look, he <laughs> so he originally had it with a camera above so you could watch yourself. So there's a playback for your butt to watch yourself, I guess. So that's kind of funny. This was actually his first um, like crazy CRT build, which was called the TV cello. Uh, one of the earliest ones. And it is an awesome piece. I mean, look at that. He had the They're full acrylic. Cases. Yeah, cases for the CRTs that just look awesome. And I mean, look at that. That down there looks like a pro video monitor style down here at the bottom. It does, sure. doesn't it, on the side? Yeah, there. it's got that circuit board built out on the side. Uh, all the way to the most simple things of just finding huh. a 1960s Westinghouse chassis and throwing it in there. This was another cool one where yeah. it's called the Egg. And uh, this this had a lot of different renditions, uh, but yeah, you can see it's just a closed circuit camera right here with an egg, pointing at an egg. Then you're playing it back on. I like this one, five inch PVM, eight inch, fourteen inch, twenty inch, twenty five thirty, triple twenty five thirty. Cool little setup. Uh, and that this raises one's actually a recent. That raises so. a very interesting uh, point about these. These are expensive. Oh, Even yeah. at, the, at the time to make, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll need 10, 20, 30s. Okay, well, that's, <laughs> well, that's 30 grand right there. All right. Let's, I know. That's, that's one of the things I have to get into because that's not what they were originally using, right? Mm. This guy was making this art in 1984, None of these PVMs existed in 1984. Oh, you're right. Yeah. These are all late 80s all the way through the 90s. So what he had would have been much simpler, maybe just you go up three sizes mm. and you go 5, 9, 14, or 5, 8, 14, or whatever. Uh, and that's how it originally started. This is way on when it's like, 
you have access to that stuff. Whereas originally it would have just been three simple mm. consumer sets. And I think that that will show up better in other uh, installs. But check out this version of it. This is a different version. You've got the egg here, egg here, egg here. And then you're using, they're using actually consumer sets here, except for these. I think these are 2030s. They may be 2530s. But you see how it goes f f increasing another just simple rendition of the same kind of piece. And then it's got like an egg with a woman about to hatch in it. Mm. Very, very strange. So this really um, brings up the, the topic that we, we touched on in the episode on your channel. It's like, what was the artist's original intent? What did they use? What's consumer? Was a crappy consumer? Good consumer? Professional level stuff. What did they use and what was their intent? And like... I, I think this is the Korean guy who originally said he used crappy Korean consumer TVs because that's all he had. Well, then, actually, this guy would have had a little bit better, but, but later it's still, on, his career, but it's let's still say, yeah. just even at the time period, he's when he's coming out with these, they don't, there weren't tubes that good mm. ever till later on. Uh, so yeah, it's like, well, for example, this is one of the things that we can see on this this slide right here how these tvs probably have good aspect ratio right mm -hmm. seem to but you've got the big black dead spots <laughs> and i guarantee you on the original sets that wouldn't have been there right mm. so that's one of the things i want to talk to him about is like uh, do you want to have this service to where the aspect ratio i mean i understand is it important to fit the whole egg and have to be or could it right could we expand that? Would you prefer to have it expanded a little bit and have no black and have more of a what I feel to be natural look? Because that's what I feel like we run into some troubles here is these these I don't think those are intentional and I don't know to me. Sure. It just, you know. And that's what you're here to do is you're here to right. point these things out. And then, the, you know, then it's a museum curator, I guess, is at their level of uh, authority. What do or they want to do? Yeah. What do right. they want to do with it? Because you see on this one here, definitely that is filling a wider. That's a, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's properly over scanned, right? Mm -hmm. Properly over scanned where you're still getting the whole image and you're not catching any uh, blacked out zone. And then you have a hard edge there that doesn't look natural. As far as like I, you know, from looking at CRTs, but that's the last of the eggs. So this is just kind yeah, of the so gist of how of this robot, is going. Becoming cool. robot. This was a really cool piece where he's made robots out of different styles of televisions. Um, so cool. Yeah, just close ups of, and a lot of these are really old school, iconic televisions. A lot of wood, very strange, and even uh, some of these. The heads are, you know, these uh. whatever they are. I'm not sure. Um, and then they produce an image on them that's like a, a playback where it just looks like two eyes are, you mm -hmm. know, in the face of the robot. Uh, and then, yeah, there's some more. I liked this one. I like that because <laughs> I just like that CRT and it's like a whole metal frame. Yeah, that's like PVMosaurus. Like that's yeah, Vol that's Voltron kind of, of PVMs. <laughs> yeah, it looks really, really cool. I think that one looks like my favorite. And yeah. I think those are all just like heartbeats on there. Very cool. Another one. Um, just a couple robots, uh, lots of, I imagine, and see here, see here, I don't feel like you get the same problem, although it's still there because mm. the video playback is a different size than the actual tube. I just don't think that on this one, it's as, as impactful as something more like that, where you're literally like this one, you have more distraction, but see, I do like, um, look how this guy over here, this, he seems to be pretty good. Yeah, they seem to be on all his tubes time. so it's like that one to me looks great as far as like that and determining concerned. the intent of the artist do they mean this do they yeah. care about this does the artist <laughs> make it with the sets of the day and then 10 years later there's pvm 2030 he's like hey that's uh -huh. great i want to use those instead for the next one like yeah because it's like i would have used those it's like saying uh, you know would you use the best artistic materials available at the time Mm, um, maybe maybe not you know maybe not yeah maybe there's yeah. some there's definitely something lost and i think that's what we'll see in like some of the more you see in some of the more modern artists that will grab gravitate towards some of these things uh but yeah that's the robot and um 
I want to see this next one. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, talk about Zen this. for TV. We were laughing about this one, kind of. So I, I found a short clip on. It was like a minute long interview from the 1970s, probably maybe late 60s, talking to the artist, and uh, he said that he showed up to an installation in 1963 with a, some TV sets for playback, and one of the sets. He turned it on when he was getting set up for the exhibit and it had vertical line collapse. So, of course, it had, a, you know, the problem that people ask how to fix. It had that mm. vertical line collapse, single line TV. And uh, so he he said it looked terrible, but he was at the at the exhibit. So he just turned the TV on its side and put it on a pedestal and entitled it Zen for TV. And back in 1963, he said it was the most uh, impactful one of that installation. Like it was the most popular mm. exhibit where he had multiple things put on. And so that was 63. I imagine the um, that became more of uh, an idea and a flame for him to, oh, yeah, you know what? I do have the ability to go in and do things with these CRTs that may seem, you know, simple but at the same time people really do like it consider it an art and um so again yeah it's just a very interesting piece where you have literally got to have a set with vertical collapse and you turn See, it on look at that side. one does that look like vertical collapse or they've actually just produced a white see i image? don't know if they have that but I, I was wondering the same thing that's why i found the interview so intriguing because mm -hmm. he said it was this they were asking him about it and he says it's a single line television and I was wondering the same thing, if he had made a video that just produced a single line or if it was literally failure. And he said, no, this is when he's like the set collapsed. And, you know, usually you at home would call the TV repairman, right? <laughs> he said, oh, I just thought, it, you know, I'd rotate it and it became the best piece. <laughs> right. Like, so I can imagine for the original piece that happened, but then now we're seeing other pieces, right. we're seeing the evolution of his work. And does that matter? Like good no right or wrong. Do yeah. to replicate his piece, do you need a genuine collapsed line TV or is it enough just to shine a white line up and down the middle? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And I don't think that but see, we know that if you do what you're saying, you could end up with um you will end up with it. Then you have to worry about the black space on the tube. Uh, you know, yeah. is it tuned right? Is it showing through blooming a color? Mm -hmm. Or is it blooming white if you're doing just a video of it, right? Because you're doing a video, you're reproducing a line and then two black areas. Whereas with this, those areas are just dead. Like there's no phosphors being lit up. Mm -hmm. So it's literally going to be black as the tube can be. So I don't know. And that's that's one of the things I plan on asking. Yeah. Uh, because that, okay, these, was these are people that have done these exhibits. So they should have some knowledge. So I'll be able to learn that. Oh, that's but I know a, like, what that's originated fascinating. Out of that. So this is a really fascinating point about me about this art. Because like as you said, if it's if it's the genuine original glitch TV era state, then that black would be yeah, right, no phosphor, purely black. If, however, I replicated it by producing an image that's black with a white line down the middle, the black wouldn't be the same. The black. No, would it's be gonna the, be it's gonna be the TV's interpretation of black. Of black, and this comes back to something we know in our retro gaming representation of black, deep blacks. How do you get a black off a CRT? Is different to black off an LCD or an OLED. These ideas that we have for retro gaming, a hundred percent apply for this art here. And what I was also interested in, in, in this form of art, Steve, is, is when you presented it to me earlier, um, that even in the world of video art, now we're already seeing at least two distinct areas. One, where the artist displays an intended video graphic to the screen, um, you know, like our original guy presenting the pictures of America and Oklahoma and Kansas and playing something. And now we've got another form of art where they're taking a CRT and manipulating the insides to produce an image in an unintended manner, like the line, like 
putting a magnet on the screen that I know yeah. we've got some images coming up there. That's a whole other form of CRT video art. And um, yeah, they're both CRT, but they're, they're really different from one another. I know. And a cool thing is, is this is all from the same artist. Every single one of these pieces is the same artist. So you can see where he went from that early on, very simplistic uh, set. And, and it expanded to the point where he didn't stay in that one thing his his ultimate goal led to where we started that projection of the united Mm. states those massive video walls those were all towards the end of his career and like you know his sistine chapel mona lisa probably feeling moments personally and these would have been the more entry level things that got him on it going on his art career uh but like you said there's even he was first to do this is an old old black and white only television from the 50s that he has set a uh just a large industrial u horseshoe shaped magnet on top of and i've seen this one running in uh in a video format and there's no movement of that pattern okay but that pattern is generated again this is a good example you're generating a black screen on a black and white tube by just powering it on. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you maybe even turn up a little bit of uh, brightness and contrast so that you get that bloom on your screen. Not normally you wouldn't want that for video playback, but for the art purposes that will help um, show more of this magnetic effect on the tube. So literally just throw that on there, turn it on and it makes this incredible pattern that just stays on the screen. Um, and that's that's an early example again. Would have been right after that Zen for TV, you can tell. We were mm-hmm. talking about that, how it's kind of moving 63 to 65, and then on to the uh, later projects that started involving more, you know, multi CRTs into the 70s. Okay, and he's in 71, and then, he's not doing that. Right. Show. And then 71, he does that. And then 73, he's into the chair. And in the 80s, he starts getting into the video walls and all the big video robots and things like that. So, very, And then finally, you know, the big video walls. Mm-hmm. So that's um, – here's another thing. In uh, the last slide is him uh, using what looks like the giant degaussing cable in front of a CRT to generate uh, – you know, you energize that field and it does that degauss effect. Like mm-hmm. when you degauss your butt – you only do degausser on your CRT – and it will do what's happening on this screen for only a second because it's, you know, boom and stopping and letting all the energy stop. He would design uh, special loops and set them in front of these older TVs and have them like randomly energize during a video mm-hmm. format. So like you'd be watching it and it wouldn't be a huge amount of energy, but it'd be enough to manipulate it. And over a speech, it would have like this wave effect. And even like um, what he's working with here, how it, it looks like he's making like a face almost, right? Like the two eyes in the center almost oh, yeah. look like a being looking back at him from the tube. Oh, very and X-Files, yeah. Yeah, yes, that kind of stuff. So uh, this was my last slide on him. I'll probably find some, I know it sounds crazy, I'll probably find some slides of that last one I was just telling you about because it's not in here and put pictures of that. Uh, because after this, I plan on doing an example where I'm going to take a tube and um, I'm going to set it up with a white screen probably. And then I'll take a magnet and magnetize the front of the screen and get all the phosphors all over the place. You could draw things like that, but then you need to have a strong degausser. So I'll pull out the degaussing coil and, you know, show all that. Cause I think that's kind of a um, cool aspect of this, just to show the kind of creativity of using, uh, the CRT technology as an art medium itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, I know we were talking about this before as well. I think you, you, the, the way that you've spoken about this and the research you've done and your knowledge of the tools of the trade, like I, I would love to see Steve do some sort of installation in this way. Uh, like what you've said, manipulating it with a, 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 a coil or something like that, or the magnet producing something like, it's like, this isn't just like, oh, I'm an artist. I'll do something arty. Like, you're capable of this as well. I'd love to see that one well, day. Who knows? We were talking. I think the, I think this, the exciting thing to me is um, 
that that's where we're coming into play with a lot of these new things. How does how do we take technology that's now available and make this even better? And I'm thinking like, man, we we're just talking about a a Mister Hat that lets you manipulate uh, f- effects on a screen just by twisting a potentiometer. And I could think just from the artistic hmm. idea of having a video playback, but just like where this, you have the ve- the magnetism changing it. Another layer to the artistic idea is manipulating those potentiometers to intentionally create video that maybe it originates from something you digitally made on a computer, yet you can use the mister to play it back somehow, right? And sure. do these kind of things with it. Or even if it is, if... If the intent, I mean, you could even make an installation of like, I, I don't know. I, I think that maybe you'd get in trouble from Nintendo for trying to make an art installation using like Mario. Mm-hmm. But you could do something where it's like a TV that intentionally vertically scrolls and um, or has another problem. Let's say a failing capacitor in the power supply and it makes it wave like this. And yeah, you intentionally yeah. do that. And you intentionally overcrap the dots, you know, dot pattern on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe Sega's better because they seem to be a little bit more forgiving and not as anal about their IP. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but so we like, see the point. You we could take and yeah, yeah. What if it is? What if it becomes Sonic? What if the playback becomes just Sonic uh, standing in front of the waterfall? And making the image so distorted on some kind of crazy CRT that looks like it fell out of, that looks like it got thrown out, thrown up out of a 1990s uh, children's arcade like Mm. uh, Chuck E. Cheese. And it has this grungy controller and the whole art piece is like it attempts to make you think you could play it. But what if we screw with people more and make like all the buttons in the controller backwards? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then like, so that is the art. Like, whoa. I mean, where are we just coming up with ideas here off the fly? And that's, <laughs> but it, that's, that's just the beginning. That's the yeah. kind of thing sure. that just like I think about, I'm like, well, that would be cool, but does anybody care? Well, I mean, about some Apparently does, people right? do. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I am, I think that. Um, I can just tell by the way, and I'm glad we got to do this because this is helpful for me to sit here and like our discussion on this topic has lasted 40 minutes and we've only made it through this. Yeah. I mean, this is a good portion of this presentation, but that's like Mm. half of it. So it's a good experience for me. Um, I can personally tell that this is stuff that's sticking into my head and like passionate because it comes out and it feels like it is right. It's not like just something you're trying to learn by the book and you don't care about and then give a presentation on. So, um, anyway, I'm really, uh, yeah, I'm really excited. That's just one bit again of the whole portion that we went through here. And, um, I even feel like, you know, after we come back from the trip, we could talk more about how it went yeah on like a level and oh, i think we be, need to yeah yeah and then we'll, they'll, we will follow up with like i'll bring out portions that um were just like stand out that yeah we don't know because again these are new presentations i have no idea of what's going to be good what's going to be well sure. received and the things i could think are really good could be like you know crickets you know how it is <laughs> you're a c- comedian the things you think work <laughs> Are good, and then that. sometimes you're like, yeah. "This joke's stupid," and it could be your best joke, right? And I think so, so much as well. We need to all these like what ifs that we've had about um, screens and intent, and 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 these uh, people will be able to answer so many questions. Oh, we've seen this and we've seen that. I think you're going to get a wealth of information from these individuals in the museum about how it's perceived and how it's perceived from them. Just this totally different angle to retro gaming. We're so much in our world and our games and focused on 240p and then so forth. Like how these people, these things, these devices that we all seem to love and admire and care for and how there are other people that also love and admire and care for them for almost completely different reasons. I think it's fascinating. It definitely is. And I think that 
by just looking at what you've seen uh, on these presentations, the the slides, you can tell that this is something that th the CRT is important. It's like saying that would be like saying that going and just looking at a picture of the Mona Lisa on the same size hmm. of something that's either a print or put onto a uh, screen. It's not the same. It's, mm -hmm. it's like that is part of the experience. So it's very important to all this stuff because once the TVs go away, there's no way to recreate this. There's no, and to get the artistic intent, you can forget about that. We won't be arguing about whether it's a consumer or pro set. It's just like what's left that can even show. You'll just have to see videos of this, <laughs> the installs, right? Right. And look yeah, at yeah. it from a book. Mm -hmm. And then you could see people trying to recreate it with modern stuff. Maybe they can. Maybe they make a box TV that looks like a box TV with an LCD screen. They just that's the future rather than letting it die, which I'm fine with if there's nothing, nothing left. But uh, I, it, it brings up. I mean, it's it's a very interesting thing that um, I'm hoping this wows people on the industrial level who who get to see this mm -hmm. again so that maybe I could become, uh, you know, more involved with this. Uh, and I think the aspect of us, you know, already having a social media presence and following can only help that. Um, sure. uh, it's a completely different new field uh, as far within a field. Hmm. Ooh, all right. So you're going to you're going to go and do this. So uh, we'll wrap up the episode here. Uh, you, you're off to do that next week. So maybe we know we're, we're going to have to. Not right. sure when we're going to be able to record the next episode because you'll be off actually doing this work. <laughs> Probably the week after that we can get together sure. uh, because I'll be back. And then mm -hmm. I think it would be fun. We'll talk about the uh, final presentation that I don't even have written yet. I think that's a great one we could sit around. I mean, obviously, we could sit around and probably talk a while just mm -hmm. about that, about the video resolutions, downscaling. And then we could talk about how to react to it because, again, I'm going to be talking about items that are open source like um, if there's any spot for the GBSC, you know, does that pass through help? Does uh, the downscaling ability of that help them at all? Mm. Does, excuse me, also is there a retro tinks can be used anyway? What Extron devices? And then I've got a whole list of these other ones that I know they're using already that I'll be able to cover and learn more about too. So uh, we'll bring a report back and see kind of what um, what's happening with that aspect yeah nice all right so we may be having next week off but we assure you that it is in service of a very good cause steve's off there doing some great work so all right uh steve i'm really looking forward to hear how your adventures goes best of luck with it next week i think we're all we're all rooting for you it's gonna be great man <laughs> thanks man i appreciate it yeah thanks everybody for watching and uh listening and uh, just yeah so uh, get yourself so make sure you're subbed up to zez retro so that we can uh you know you know when that next video comes out and you can follow along with this project because i'm having a lot of fun kind of document this journey here and um you, you're going to get much more behind the scenes and depth in this kind of conversation than anything i'll be able to put out uh on the main channel so that's that's really an incentive there Nice one. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next time.